All right. Well, uh, turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 2. Uh, Brother Robin, you can have my very last one. I don't think Joan has one. Oh, she does. No, 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 no. I don't need one. I can print them. I mean, <laughs> I wrote it. I don't need it. <laughs> so uh, uh, I love the book of Jeremiah. As I, as I already told you, I'm, I'm, some of the things that you see here are, are, are helps that I have in compiling notes and putting things together. And, um, and so those are two. If you are not aware or familiar with the work of Richard Owen Roberts, um, he is one of the guys that I've included there, the second, that second paragraph. It's actually from a, a uh, um, magazine, not a magazine, but a journal article. But it really, can't, it's really, it comes almost verbatim from one of his sermons. Richard Owen Roberts has spent his life studying um, revival. Uh, he's probably the leading, if not the leading, he's, he's got to be in the top five of the leading experts on what revival is in church. And so Richard Owen Roberts, uh, none of his sermons, I was, th I was trying to find something that I could show you of his, just, but nothing he has out there on the internet is less than like an hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> so he, he's a long preacher. He's, he's an old man at this point. I thought he was old when I met him, and that was 20 years ago. And so I don't know how old he is now. He may be 130. Um, he, he, he looks it. <laughs> but uh, he is just godly and sober-minded and um, wise when it comes to uh, things. So uh, um, that's an excerpt. That's not everything. He's the one that I've learned the idea of God's judgment as spiritual drunkenness. And we'll look a little bit of that today if we get there. Um, it, he gets it from Jeremiah 13, and so we'll, we'll look at that a little bit together. But uh, anyway, uh, let's start in Jeremiah. I said Jeremiah 2. Turn back to Jeremiah 1 and look at verse number 16. Well, 15. Uh, we'll read 15 and 16 and, as kind of a backdrop for our launch into the book of Jeremiah. So the Lord is speaking to Jeremiah. He's called him in, in verses 1 to uh, 12. Starting in verse 13, he gives him the, the vision of the boiling pot. And, uh, and so then he says in verse 15, For behold, I am calling all the families of the kingdoms of the north, declares the Lord, and they will come and they will set each one his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem and against all its walls round about and against all the cities of Judah. I will pronounce my judgments on them concerning all their wickedness, whereby they have forsaken me and have offered sacrifices to other gods and worshiped the works of their own hands. And so this is the call, really, of God on Jeremiah, the prophet's life. Uh, but it's the promise that God has now um, um, declared that Judah and Jerusalem are going to be judged. Um, and they're going to suffer great calamities. And the reason is, is because of their sin against God. Uh, he, he spells it out here. He spells it out all through the book. But uh, they've forsaken me offered sacrifices to other gods, and worshiped the works of their own hands. And so they, they are an idolatrous people. Their idolatry is demonstrated not just by them uh, worshiping other gods, but also it's demonstrated by their lack of compassion and concern towards other people. And so they're, it's, uh, the root is their heart towards or against the Lord, but the fruit of it is the way that they treat other people. And, uh, and you'll see that all through Scripture, that th what you believe determines how you act. And so those, those two things, that's why when I preach, I don't necessarily preach against actions, although I would be, I mean, the Bible is filled with preaching against actions, so I would be okay to do that. But, but actions won't change unless there's a heart change. And so when I preach, I preach, that's, that's where I aim, is at people's hearts. Um, you won't go wrong if you're chasing after the Lord. You can go wrong if you're not chasing after the Lord, but just trying to live right. 
Does that make sense? Uh, so that, so my desire is to say, well, let's go after the Lord. And that's really the, the call in the book of Jeremiah, because you're going to find that the people of Jeremiah are still doing things that they've been told to do in the past, and they're saying, look, we're okay. We're still doing these things. But the Lord says, your heart's far from me. You, you, don't, you don't have any desire to be around me. So that's, uh, that's what we're going to look at. We're going to, I'm, I'm going to show you the outline. It's just a brief not even a good outline of the book of Jeremiah. Um, it's only here to show you that it can be broken down in certain ways, so it's going to be a brief thing, and then, uh, and then I'll get, we'll start looking at some highlights of the book. So here's the outline of the book of Jeremiah. We've already looked at the call of the prophet. Um, chapter 1 is the call of, of Jeremiah. Um, chapters 2 through 29 uh, remember, I told you it's a, it's a rough outline. It's not, it's not precise. Uh, but chapters 2 through 29 demonstrate this certain captivity of Judah. It's coming. They are going to be taken over by, by Babylon. And so it's the certain captivity of Judah. Chapters 30 through 33 uh, highlight the restoration of Israel. Now, this restoration of Israel is not only in the near term, them coming back out of exile, but it also is the promise of the future. So it's in this, it's in this section, chapters 30 through 33, that you'll find the promise of the new covenant um, in Jeremiah 31. And so that's a significant place. The new covenant is spelled out in three books of the Bible. In Jeremiah, and I'm sorry, four books of the Bible, three in the Old Testament, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah's and Ezekiel's are almost word for word. And then in Hebrews chapter 8, um, the writer of the book of Hebrews grabs it, the almost exact word for word from Jeremiah or Ezekiel, and posits that it's begun in the Lord Jesus, that the old is, has gone and the new has come. And so a uh, very significant passage uh, then there are miscellaneous messages from 34 to 45. Um, remember that not only is Jeremiah preaching and, and these things are being written down, these um, uh, oracles, if you will, these uh, prophecies from the Lord, words from the Lord, but also he's living in real time. And so as he's living in real time, there are real events that are coming against him, and he's having to speak to them and address them. And so those are those miscellaneous messages there as he, as he goes through these things. Um, nobody liked Jeremiah except for about four people. And, and so he, and, and the reason was he was speaking the truth and they didn't want to hear the truth. And so they didn't like him. In fact, even today we're going to see where he was kind of already starting to be persecuted um, in, in, in real time for his, for his preaching. And then, uh, and then finally, it's in the, it ends up with messages concerning the nations. And so Egypt and Assyria and Babylon and on and on and on. Um, and, and we see this. This is kind of the, um, uh, the mark of the prophecies that we've seen up till now. All the books that we've seen, almost all of them, especially the longer ones, have had some addresses toward the other nations. Uh, and I just, uh, I, if you remember, I've always tried to say that God's plan was not ever only for Israel, but to use Israel as, and then expand out into all the nations. And so we'll see some of that as we go through it. So this morning, I, I'm going to, I've taken a, a pretty sizable bite in, in Jeremiah. I've, I'm trying to remind myself that this is not a course on Jeremiah, that this is Old Testament survey, and I should survey it. And so I, I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying really, 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 really hard to, to just give a surface level here. Look at this, look at this, look at this. Um, and so I've taken a pretty sizable chunk out today. If we don't get to it because I get bogged down and forget we're doing a survey, just bear with me and we'll pick up and, and go on. Um, I, here's what I know. I can't go wrong because it's God's Word. So whether we go slow or whether we go fast, it's still God's Word. But I am trying to keep the spirit of the thing going. Um, I don't want some of you to age out of Old Testament survey before I finish Old Testament survey. So, um, <laughs> uh, or me either. So, um, so we're going to, uh, we're going to keep going. 
Uh, I want to show you two visions that were given to Jeremiah, uh, and, and we see it here in his call, in the, in the call, and it's, it's starting in verse 11, uh, 11 and 12, the word of the Lord came to me saying, what do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you've seen it well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. So here's the deal. Uh, you don't need to know a lot about this, except that uh, the almond tree was always the first to bloom in the coming spring. And so uh, the, the, uh, the take on this is that this almond tree um, is, is the sure sign of the, uh, of the coming season. And so God says, I'm going to watch over my word and make sure it comes true. So that's what, the, so this is God's assurance to Jeremiah that the words that he gives him are going to be fulfilled. And that's important because remember the, this whole book, all of Jeremiah is against the backdrop that Jeremiah is the only guy who's saying, y'all go into Bab go, go to Babylon. This is judgment. If you go to Babylon, you'll be safe. If you stay here and fight, you're going to all be wiped out. Well, nobody else wants that. Everybody else is saying, no, no, we're going to have peace. It's going to be okay. God's going to deliver us. Well, if you're a preacher and you're saying something that nobody else is saying, it can get kind of lonely and you, you begin to question yourself. So God's, the very first vision God gives him is saying, look, this word, this may be the first time you hear this, but it's going to be true. So that's the almond tree. The second one is the boiling pot. Uh, that's starting in verse 13 and going on. I'll just read the first two verses there in 13, 14, because I read 15 and following. 13 says, the word of the Lord came to me a second time saying, what do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot facing away from the north. Then the Lord said to me, out of the north, the evil will break forth on all the inhabitants of the land. So it's a boiling pot. Think oil. It may not be oil, but think boiling oil. Um, because that was, that, that was the way the, in the sieges of those days. It was a weapon, and it's, and it's going to tip over from the north onto them. And so this sure destruction is coming. So that's the, the how do you like to be called in the ministry with those two signs? Look, it's going to happen even if nobody else says it is. And oh, by the way, what's going to happen is utter destruction. So that's your message smile, it's going to be okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, you know, that's really, that, that's really the way it is. And by the way, I'll just say this. I, I like, I preached on joy last night. Christians ought to be filled with joy, but there are some messages that you, when you preach them, you cannot smile. And, uh, and that's just because of the, the way that the world is and the sure judgment God's going to bring on sin. And not just on sin, but on sinners who are unrepentant. And so then we, then we pick up uh, Yahweh's contention with Judah. This is chapter 2. I'm not going to go, uh, I know you're thinking, all right, we've done chapter 1, now we're going to chapter 2. Uh, I'll start skipping around, but you need to hear this. This is significant. Um, go down to verse 11 of chapter 2. God asks, um, well, I'll pick it in verse 9. I, I hate to jump right in the middle. Therefore, I will yet contend with you, declares the Lord, and with your son's sons I will contend. For cross to the coastlands of Katim and see, and send to Kedar and observe closely, and see if there has been such a thing as this. Has a nation changed gods when they were not gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this, and shudder. Be very desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And so his contention with Judah is this question, has a nation changed gods? Well, what he's saying here is even the pagan nations don't change gods. Even the pagans don't change gods, when, and their gods aren't real gods. Why have you abandoned me to go after gods that aren't gods? How uh, This has never even been seen. He, in fact, he says, go and look. Go around. Go to Katim. Go to Kedar. Go look at those places and see if this has happened. But here, you've done it. And so, that's his contention. Has a nation ever changed gods? And you have. And then, there are two, there are two evils. They're, they're really, I call them twin evils, although it says here, um, two evils. They're twin evils because they go together. 
they've forsaken the Lord, so they've turned away from the one true God, and they've turned, and he's the fountain of living water. So if you're, if you're um, uh, let me use it this, if you're going to go buy a house, um, you're going to buy a house that either has city water or your land perks, so you can have a well, right? You're not going to buy someplace that doesn't have um, that, that doesn't have a, 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 a live water source. Uh, and in fact, when back a year ago, a little longer than that, when Myra and I were starting to look around, we, we had seen some land that looked pretty reasonable. And we're like, hey, that, let's just buy some land until we found out that they didn't have any water source. Well, that's dumb to buy land that doesn't have water. That's what they've done. They've turned away from their water source, the only source of living waters, and they've, they've dug out wells or cisterns, um, holding pools, if you will. They've dug out these pools, and they're broken, and they can't hold any water. So not only aren't they the, aren't they the source of water, they can't even hold water. And so this is the, these are the twin evils of God's people. Are you getting the picture of what's happening here? Uh, th this is just, it's absurd and God tells them it's absurd, and yet they've run headlong away from it. Um, it's even more absurd. I'm, I'm going to liken this to something, so I want you to, It's even more absurd than the absurdities that are going on in our nation. And, and there are some crazy things that are happening here. But this is even more absurd. And you say, how is it even more absurd? Well, these are the people that God led out of Egypt— these are the people that God opened the waters for and they crossed over. These are the people that time and time and time again, God has shown up and shown out in their presence so that they could actually see miracles happening and they've turned away from him. In fact, their only, their only foundation was him and they've, they've turned away from it. So this is Yahweh's contention. This, and so this runs throughout the rest of the book. This is what God has against them. If you, as you read this, if you were to say, why is God so angry at Judah? It's because of this. This is his statement. They have turned away from me and they've done it in a dumb way. To quote Dr. Skinner, it's dumb. <laughs> he, he would say often, that's just dumb. And, uh, and that's what this is. It's just, it's just dumb. Well, what they did is, is just ludicrous. So uh, God continues in this discussion, and now he changes the course of what he's accusing them of. It's not just, um, it's not just idolatry, but he's saying it's harlotry. Um, and he, because he is their husband, and they as a people are his bride, and they have turned elsewhere for their marital relationship. And so, and, and it, it, he's pretty, I'm, I'm not going to go too far in this, but he's fairly uh, um, forthright in his discussion about what they've done. He's accused them of being like an animal in heat. Uh, I hope that's not ugly, but that's what the Bible says. <laughs> a wild donkey accustomed to the wilderness that sniffs the wind in her passion. In the time of her heat, who can turn her away? All who seek her will not become weary. In her month, they will find her. Now, I know enough of you have lived on farms or had animals that I don't need to express this any more than that. But that's what he's accusing his people of, of just being like a uh, to use a, a, a euphemism that we would say, being like a tomcat, except the opposite of a tomcat, uh, Jill cat, I don't know, whatever, and, you know, whatever the opposite of a, uh, of a tomcat is, that, uh, that is just out playing the field. And, uh, you know, we would, uh, my, my granddaddy had livestock, and we would have to uh, when when the the females would go into that time, we would have to separate the males from them, and they would tear down fences and you know knock over gates and uh, just to and that's the picture that that God is wanting to bring. That is what he's saying. You're going after other gods is that, and so I mean this is fairly explicit. Yeah, but it's but but it's. But it's what, I mean, 
This is what he, and, and then he compares, and this is interesting, he compares Judah with Israel. Now, who is Israel? They're the northern kingdom, and, and God already destroyed them by letting the Assyrians come and take them away. Right? And so he, he in, ver, in chapter 3, verses 6 to 10, he says, Then the Lord said to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what faithless Israel did? She went up on every high hill and, every, and under every green tree, and she was a harlot there. I thought, after she has done all these things, she will return to me, but she did not return, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw that for all the adulteries of faithless Israel, I had sent her away and given her a writ of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but she went and was a harlot also. Because of the lightness of her harlotry, she polluted the land and committed adultery with stones and trees, yet in spite of all this, her treacherous sister Judah did not return to me with all her heart, but rather in deception, declares the Lord. Now, I'm going to go on. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I want you to see two things. First, he's speaking in the time of Josiah. Remember last week, and if you weren't here, you don't remember, but Josiah was the king that came out and, and from the top, from up above, um, changed, brought about reform. He, he, I believe Josiah reformed his own heart. He came alive uh, with the Lord and after reading the word and he commanded that every high hill all the groves all the bad stuff be torn down the Asherim poles cut all of that idolatry stuff taken away but notice it's still in that part when Josiah is the king that God says Judah has returned but with deception and so the people were still practicing, the people's hearts were still away from God, even though Josiah the king tried to implement this reform from, from up high. Does that, do I need to go any further? You understand what I'm trying to say. The people's hearts didn't reform, even though their actions reformed. And so God announces that while Josiah is still king. So while there's still a good king on the throne, there's still a problem with the people. That's what God says right there. The second thing I want you to see about this harlotry is the harlotry is not just spiritual. When they were, when they were practicing this idolatry in the high places at those, at those foreign God temples, at those places, they were actually committing sexual immorality as part of their practices, both male and female prostitution taking place. All of that all of that a part of this idolatry. But there is hope in the midst. Uh, in verses 15 to 18, the Lord kind of wraps this up. Then I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you on knowledge and understanding. Something you need to know in the Old Testament. When the Old Testament talks about shepherds, they are not talking about pastors or preachers or priests or religious leaders. In the Old Testament, they are talking about political leaders, kings, princes, um, leaders who will lead the people from within. And so um, that's just something that you need to keep in mind. In the Old Testament, when we talk about shepherds, when God talks about shepherds, he's talking about um, um, leaders that would be different than what we would think, um, perhaps, uh, perhaps different than what we would think. And so, but there's hope. I'm going to give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you on knowledge and understanding. It shall be in those days when you are multiplied and increased in the land, declares the Lord. They will no longer say the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and it will not come to mind, nor will they remember it, nor will they miss it, nor will it be made again. At that time, they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and, for the name of, uh, and all the nations will be gathered to it, to Jerusalem, for the name of the Lord, nor will they walk any more after the stubbornness of their evil heart. Well, he is clearly speaking about what happens when Jesus comes, who ultimately is the great shepherd, the good shepherd after his heart, and all of the nations will come to Jerusalem. So this is one of those prophecies that is future that uh, I believe started when Jesus came with his ministry, but won't finish until Jesus returns and sets up his kingdom on the earth. Does that make sense? All right, so, but I want, well, the, the main thing I want you to see is the hope. There's hope right there in the midst of this, of this uh, judgment that goes on. Uh, the next thing we see is Judah's wickedness highlighted by their trust in religion. Turn over to Jeremiah chapter 7. Uh, 
obviously I'm skipping a lot, but I told you I have to give you a, an overview. I can't give you line by line, um, or I could, but we'd be here for a while. Starting in verse number one, God's word says this, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, stand in the gate of the Lord's house. So he's at the temple and proclaim there this word and say, hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah who enter by these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words, saying, This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly practice justice between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, nor walk after other gods to your own ruin, then I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever." So let me explain this. This is one of the key passages in the book of Jeremiah. Because what the people were doing were they were practicing all of this wickedness, all of this idolatry outside. They were going to high places, hills, groves, other places, and they were practicing this idolatry. And they were also, because they practiced this idolatry, they were also practicing wickedness in their day-to-day -day lives. And so they were, uh, they were oppressing the alien, the foreigner. So they, the, those who weren't like them, they were oppressing, they were um, using them and, and taking advantage of them being there. They were oppressing those who were less fortunate, the widows and the orphans. They were shedding innocent blood. We'll talk about that later. Um, they were, so they were doing all this stuff in their daily lives. So idolatry through the week, misdeeds, sin in their relationships with others also through the week. But then on the Sabbath day, they were going to the temple as if to worship the one true God. And they were saying, everything's going to be okay because we have the temple. That's what that means. You hear these words saying, the temple, the temple, the temple. That's them saying, hey, everything's okay. God's still with us. And by the way, that's, the, that's going to be the theme of the false prophets throughout the book of Jeremiah. God's still with us. He's not going to judge us. Everything is okay. Our churches are still open. We're still here on Sunday. And yet throughout the rest of the week, they were following after idols and they were doing things they ought not be doing. And so that's the problem with Judah in those days. And I would just suggest to you that that is a great learning point for Christians today that we need to recognize that Christianity is more than an hour and a half on Sunday mornings. But it is our whole heart towards God, which not just our whole heart, but also that changes our actions toward others. And, and last night I talked a little about, we, I, I preached from um, John chapter 15, and I, I talked about the way that we, that we are known to be God's disciples, the way that we, are, we prove to be disciples is by the fruit of our lives, not by some confession that, hey, I've been to church, or I've, I've been baptized, or I've been saved. Those aren't the, the that's not that's not the end. Now, that is how we're saved. You put your faith in Jesus, trust Christ, repent of your sin, you're saved. But the way that we prove that we're saved is by allowing our lives to be transformed and, and showing fruit. And that John 15 shows it. And that's what this is. That's not a new statement. Jesus didn't just all of a sudden come up with, hey, we need fruit. That's been the statement throughout the whole Bible that by your actions, you'll be known. By your heart, you'll be changed. By your actions, you'll be known. And so if your heart changes, your actions change. The Bible doesn't know or support a person who says they've been changed by God, and yet their actions aren't changed. And that's pretty tough preaching. Because we've got a lot of people who live like the world Monday through Saturday, and then... I think it's going to be okay. The, uh, 
Um, but they, they live, you know, they live like the world Monday through Saturday, and then Sunday they say, hey, look, I'm going to heaven when I die. Uh, I belong to Jesus, and you can't do both, uh, at least not according to what Scripture says. And so this is what he's, this is what he's holding. So religion is a failure if that's all you've got your hope in. If it's just religion, do not trust in deceptive words saying this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Don't just put your trust in religion because it will not save you. Only God, only Jesus saves you. Repentance is absolutely necessary. If you amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly practice justice between a man and his neighbor, if you don't oppress the alien, the orphan, or the widow, and do not shed innocent bloods, nor walk after God's on your, to your own room, then I'll let you dwell in this place. Then you'll be one of mine. Now be clear, heart comes first. But if the heart changes, so do the actions. And so that's what this is about. Everybody, everybody clear? Everybody good? We, so here's what happens today in today's world. Well, not necessarily just today. In my lifetime, let's say, or in your lifetime, what we see are two extremes. We see either legalism on the one hand that says if you do all these, all these things right, then God will accept you. And that's wrong. That's not good teaching. But on this side, we say, well, all you have to do is believe, and you can live however you want. It's okay. Well, that's bad preaching, too. Those two have to be joined together. So the only way anybody's ever right with God is by grace through faith. That's the only way. Uh, it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Uh, by grace, you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So, salvation, and by the way, even in the book of Jeremiah, Old Testament, you see, you got to have, you have to have a right heart towards the Lord. But that right heart always leads to right action. If it doesn't lead to right action, your heart's not right. Those two go together. And we've kind of lost the expectation of Christians to live like Jesus, to look like Jesus, to act like Jesus, to love like Jesus. We, we, we're like, ah, eh, you can live like the world as long as you say the name of Jesus. That's just not true. And so that's what this is. So I want to I be clear. I absolutely believe in salvation by grace through faith alone. It's the only way anybody can be saved. But the expectation of that person once they're saved is to be transformed and live differently. You can't, be, you can't meet Jesus and not be changed. Does that make sense? All right. I know I probably beat that to death. I just want to make sure I'm clear for everybody that understands. Jim believes you can get saved by being right. No, you can only get saved by trusting Jesus. But, yeah, then, then your life changes. So repentance is necessary. Uh, we go to chapter 13. Um, by the way, there's, there's, <laughs> there's lots and lots and lots between chapter 7 and 13. All right, I understand that. I'm just trying to give you some highlights. This may be, well, no, I can't say that. It's not. I love this chapter, but it's not my favorite in Jeremiah. Um, Thus the Lord said to me, go and buy yourself a linen waistband and put it around your waist, but do not put it in water. So I bought the waistband in accordance with the word of the Lord and put it around my waist. Then the word of the Lord came to me a second time saying, take the waistband that you've bought, which is around your waist and arise, go to the Euphrates and hide it there in a crevice of the rock. So I went and hid it by the Euphrates as the Lord had commanded me. After many days, the Lord said to me, Arise, go to the Euphrates, and take from there the waistband, which I commanded you to hide there. Then I went to the Euphrates and dug, and I took the waistband from the place where I had hidden it, and lo, the waistband was ruined. It was totally worthless. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord, Just so will I destroy the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem, this wicked people who refuse to listen to my words, who walk in the stubbornness of their hearts, and have gone after other gods to serve them and to bow down to them. Let them be just like this waistband, which is totally worthless. For as the waistband clings to the waist of a man, so I made the whole household of Israel and the whole household of Judah cling to me, declares the Lord, that they might be for me a people for renown, for praise, and for glory, but they did not listen. 
Therefore, you are to speak this word to them. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, every jug is to be filled with wine. And when they said to you, do we not very well know that every jug is to be filled with wine? Then say to them, thus says the Lord, behold, I'm about to fill all the inhabitants of this land, the kings that sit for David on his throne, the priests, the prophets, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with drunkenness. I will dash them together each against each other, both the fathers and the sons together, declares the Lord. I will not show pity, nor be sorry, nor have compassion so as not to destroy them. So here's what he's saying. The symbol of the waistband is this. And, and by the way, the waistband, if you have the King James, I think it says girdle. Um, it, some may say a belt. It's just think underwear. All right, at, at whatever whatever form it is, it's the closest thing to the body. And so he wears it without washing it for some length of time. And so then he goes and buries it in a, in a damp, moist place uh, by a river. And so when he goes back to get it, obviously, something that's not ever been cleaned, that's then been put out in a d damp place is going to be rotten and not worth anything when he, when he gets it back up. Um, I don't want to be vulgar or crude, so I'm going to use something else. Think of an old, dirty gym sock that's laid in the corner of a room for a while, and then do you want to put that thing back on? All right, so it's something like that, and God uses this. By the way, these are God's illustrations, not mine. You know, the wild donkey, that's God's illustration, not mine. Uh, the, the waistband, God's illustration, not mine. If you got a problem with it, take it up with him. Um, I'm just... I'm just the messenger delivering the mail. That's all I'm doing. And so, uh, but, but it was, it's rotten. And he says, just like that piece of garment was designed to fit closely to you, so I designed Israel and Judah to fit closely to me. And yet, they're just as rotten as that, as that uh, waistband was. And so, that's what's happened. That's, that's the whole picture of that waistband. And so, um, just a terrible, terrible phrase. Uh, I made the whole household of Israel and Judah to cling to me, that they might be for me a people for renown, for praise, and for glory, but they did not listen. And, and that's, the, that's the epitaph of Judah, and, and is, they did not listen. And, and by the way, you say, well, I thought God was a merciful God. He is. He's sending his last prophet, Jeremiah, to tell them. that. And if they would repent, if they would listen, he would, he would relent. He would restore them. But they didn't. They wouldn't listen. And so even as they mocked Jeremiah constantly, this is what they get. I mean, the, and, and it, it really changes the tone of the preaching service if you realize that this may be the last message that you get from God. This may be the last time. We don't think like that. We think, okay, uh, yeah, I kind of yawned off in the middle of the sermon today, but I'll have next week, or I'll come back Wednesday night. But that may not be, that may not be the case. Or even worse than yawning off, I heard every word of it, but I'm not going to change my life. I'll have next week. I've, I've, I've used this. I, I know I've told you this before, but I had a friend, very close friend in uh, high school and college um, who I witnessed to, shared the gospel with, and even did so at his, at his wedding, which was some years later, the last time I've seen him. And, uh, and his, his phrase was to me, hey, I'm going to live now. I'm going to live now. There'll be a day for that. But I don't, I can't promise them that there'll be a day for that. And I, and, and Jeremiah couldn't either. They, Jeremiah came and preached. They didn't listen. And that was the end. That was the end uh, of them. And so the symbol of the lemon waistband. And then the reality of spiritual drunkenness. Um, this is uh, I, I put a little bit in your passage about the waistband. I didn't have room really to, to do the rest of his sermon on this, but um, you can look it up. It's, it's really strong. But, but God's judgment on his people 
at least those who claim to be his people, is often spiritual drunkenness when, when they disobey. Uh, and that's what he says there. Um, every jug is to be filled with wine. And they're like, yeah, no kidding. That's what wine jugs are full. Be, be filled with wine. And then he says, you're going to be filled with wine. I'm going to make you drunk. And just think about what drunkenness means, what drunkenness is. People don't make rational thoughts when they're drunk. People lose all their inhibitions when they're drunk. People don't make, uh, they don't make wise decisions. They don't uh, communicate well when they're drunk. They do stupid things. They can't walk straight when they're drunk. Uh, all those things that happens in drunkenness, and the Lord uses this as the way to talk about his people when they've disobeyed him. He gives them drunkenness as a judgment to, to call them back. And I would just say that perhaps no better illustration could be made for the state of the large church in America right now than we are just drunk. We, we're not sensitive to God's word. We're living like we want to live. All kinds of crazy things done in the name of God, in the name of Jesus, all around. Uh, I mean, the, God's people are just drunk, and, and they're acting like some of them literally drunk, but others just acting spiritual drunkenness. This is judgment. God, God's judgment is not simply sometime yet future. God brings judgment now. And I believe that what we're, what we're seeing in America is God's judgment on us. I mean, there are people who call themselves by the name of the Lord who think it's right that men, men pretend to be women and women pretend to be men. That's drunkenness. I mean, to, to say that we don't know what a woman is, that's drunkenness. That's dumb. I mean, it, it's just it's foolishness. I'm not, I, I got the preaching. I don't mean to. I'm just saying, that's what this is. That's what this is. It's just, uh, I wonder, hey, do, do kids learn the story about the emperor who has no clothes anymore? You know, well, you, you know that story that he goes around and everybody's like, oh, those are pretty clothes, but he's naked because they weren't really clothes. Do we tell that story anymore? <laughs> I mean, because that's what's happening in our, I mean, oh, yes, you're the, you're the best woman of the year who was a man six months ago. You know, what in the world? And oh, by the way, that person is a conservative. What's up with that? I mean, anyway. <laughs> We're just drunk. We're just drunk. I mean, it, the whole thing is dumb. Yeah. I mean, you know, what in the world? <laughs> and then, oh, man, to put this all, I just want you to hear this. By the way, you see all this that I've been talking about. We're only supposed to be single bullet points. <laughs> I'm just supposed to tell you about it. But anyway, uh, so in chapter 14, God tells Jeremiah, stop praying for them. So this is the end of of. Don't pray for them. I'll just read this to you so you can hear it. Thus says the Lord to, the, to this people, even so they have loved to wander. They have not kept their feet in check. Therefore, the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and call their sins to account. So the Lord said to me, do not pray for the welfare of this people. When they fast, I am not going to listen to their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and grain offering, I am not going to accept them. Rather, I am going to make an end of them by the sword, famine, and pestilence. That's judgment. Do not pray for them. Jeremiah responds and says, but... Lord God, I said, look, the prophets are telling them, you will not see the sword, nor will you have famine, but I will give you lasting peace in this place. Then the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying falsehood in my name. I have neither sent them, nor commanded them, nor spoken to them. They are prophesying to you a false vision, divination, futility, and the deception of their own minds. I'll stop there. There's a lot of preachers out there who are saying stupid things even today. And they're, what they're saying is contrary to the Word of God. And friends, I'm, t I, 
maybe not in your lifetime, although I'm beginning to think otherwise. I imagine in my lifetime, there will be people who do not want to hear a preacher who preaches from God's Word. Uh, like the majority. There'll be an over, unless we have revival, unless God's people fall on their faces and cry out to God and ask Him to do something that only He can do, this is the trajectory of the church in America today. They'll, they're going to bring preachers who will tell them what they want to hear and not say otherwise. Yeah, tickle their ears. The danger of false preachers. Um, in chapter 18, there's the symbol of the potter's clay. So, in case you wonder, Jeremiah's got a problem with all this. Jeremiah is fussing with God throughout all this time. Not fussing with him in a rebellious way, but just questioning him. Lord, why? Why are you doing this? Why, why won't you let them repent? Why aren't you going to, you know, come on, Lord, give us a chance. And then personally, Lord, why are you telling me to, why am I telling you this? In fact, there's a place where Jeremiah says, I am not going to, I'm not going to preach that anymore. I'm not going to carry your message, God. And then immediately says, but your word was a fire in my bones and I had to, I had to proclaim it. I had to say it. So, because of Jeremiah's uprightness towards the Lord, he had to, but he didn't want to. And so, he gets to chapter 18 right here, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will announce my words to you. I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something on the wheel, but the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter, so he remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so you are in my hand, O house of Israel. God made him. He could do what he wanted to. That's his answer to, Jer uh, to Jeremiah. I'm in charge of, of this. I have every right. I am free to, to exercise my judgment as I wish to. And so that's this... Um, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own. You know that song, uh, thou art the potter, I am the clay, mold me and make me. Well, that's the good side of the potter um, because the bad side of the potter is I'll, I can take this thing and break it into pieces. I can change it. It doesn't have to be what, what it is now. And so that's the, that's the, the story of the, the potter and his clay here. And it, it goes on. It's, it's the whole chapter, and you can read all of it. Yeah, he, so she asked, didn't God give him opportunity after opportunity? In fact, yes, that's, Jer that's what Jeremiah is, this final opportunity. But realize that he didn't have to give them one opportunity. All right, he can, because he's the potter, if it doesn't end up like he wants it, he can destroy it. So the answer is yes, he did. The, the truth is God is patient. That's part of his name. That's part of who he is. He's patient and long-suffering, and he's merciful uh, and so, because of his character, he's, he is merciful, but he doesn't have to be. And that's what he's saying to Jeremiah. There's no, I can be merciful once, or I can be merciful a million times, but nobody else tells me how often I have to be merciful. I can do what I want when I want. And that's, that's God's freedom, if you will. You know, we often talk about uh, free will, um, you know, that, that mankind has free will. Nobody has more free will than God, right? God's free will is the ultimate free will, and uh, whatever He wills comes to pass. And so, I just say that to say, if we expect that we have freedom to act, we ought to at least allow that God also has freedom to act, too. Chapter 19, God's judgment on Hinnom. I told you about this when we were talking about Isaiah. Uh, the valley of Hinnom is the valley that runs to the south of, um, of Jerusalem. The valley of Hinnom, there were two things that you should know about it. First, it was the garbage dump of Jerusalem. It's where they would take the garbage, throw it out, and they would burn it. And it also was the place where they uh, did their child sacrifices. So they burned kids alive in Hinnom excuse me, in this valley, uh, worshiping Molech, excuse me again, Molech and other gods, small g gods. So, um, the, the word Gehenna, 
where we get hell from, it originated with this valley of Hinnom that, um, that the fires never go out. They burn and burn and burn and burn, and it's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And I told you two weeks ago or so that th this, this smoke that's coming out of the valley of Hinnom filled up with trash and innocent blood would intermingle with the incense that was coming off the altar from the, from the temple. And just think how disgusting that would be for God to breathe in. Remember, that incense is supposed to be God's, God's, God takes joy in that incense. So now you've got this trash heap that's, that's killing innocent blood. That smoke is intermingling with the good smoke, the pure smoke, and God says, I'm not having any of it. It's, it's also the same picture of the, of the lukewarm in Revelation. Cold, hot, coming together, good for nothing. So that's this, that's this picture. All right, so he judges them at, because of their actions at Hinnom. And by the way, it, it, so much did he judge them that that word came to mean what we translate as hell. That, that's that, that place. So that's chapter 19. Shortly after this, chapter 20, Jeremiah is beaten up by a priest. <laughs> So, when Pasher the priest, the son of Immer, who was chief officer in the house of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things, Pasher had Jeremiah the prophet beaten and put him in the stocks that were in the upper Benjamin gate, which was by the house of the Lord. So, because Jeremiah was preaching God's word, the priest, the guy who's in charge of it, had had enough and had him beaten. And, um, and so... After this, Yahweh gives Pasher, this priest, a new name. And his new name is terror on every side. That's God's curse on Pasher the priest. You are no longer being called Pasher. Pasher is not the name the Lord has called you, but rather Magor Misabib, which means terror on every side. You are going to pay for this. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I am going to make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends. And while your eyes look on, they will fall by the sword of their enemies. So I will give over all Judah to the hand of the king of Babylon, and he will carry them away as exiles to Babylon and will slay them with a sword. I will also give over all the wealth of this city, all its produce and all its costly things, even all the treasures of the king of Judah. I will give over to the hand of their enemies, and they will plunder them, take them away, and bring them to Babylon." because you would not listen. And so then, Jer remember, Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. And so Jeremiah laments here. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I would ever say this, but he says, O Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You have overcome me and prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all day long. Everyone mocks me. So here's what Jeremiah says. Jeremiah, I think Jeremiah was expecting that when he preached, people would respond. I think that was his expectation. And when they beat him up, he, he didn't like it. And he didn't just blame the priest for beating him up. He blamed God. God, you gave me this word. Now I'm a mockery. And by the way, all of Jeremiah's life, he lived as a mockery. He, wasn't, he didn't sell out crowds. You know, he didn't travel the world and people fill up stadiums. He preached God's word and he got beaten up. He got laughed at. Ultimately, he got sent to Egypt and stoned there because of his preaching the word of the Lord. How's that for a call to ministry? <laughs> you know, I'm going to call you to ministry, Jim, and uh, you're going to be to root up, or you root up, pluck up, and, and, and tear down, and oh, by the way, they're not going to believe you, and you're going to die. And you can't get married, and you're not going to have any friends or any kids. That's your life. So that's Jeremiah's life. That's why he's called the, the weeping prophet, is that was his, that, that's what he preached. Jeremiah's lament, he, uh, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and I have some time, I'll go ahead and read some more. For each time I speak, this is verse 8 of chapter 20, for each time I speak, I cry aloud, I proclaim violence and destruction, because for me the word of the Lord has resulted in reproach and derision all day long. 
But if I say I will not remember him, that is the Lord, or speak any more in his name, if I quit, then in my heart it becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary of holding it in, and I cannot endure it. For I have heard the whispering of many, terror on every side. That's the name of the pastor of the priest now. Terror on every side. Denounce him. Yes, let us denounce him. All my trusted friends watching for my fall say, perhaps he will be deceived so that we may prevail against him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a dread champion. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will be utterly ashamed because they have failed with an everlasting disgrace that will not be forgotten. Yet, O Lord of hosts, you who test the righteous, who see the mind and the heart, let me see your vengeance on them, for to you I have set forth my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the soul of the needy one from the hand of evildoers. So in the course of about 10 verses, (laughs) he switched from uh, being mad at God to saying, I can't help it, I've got to preach his word, so praise the Lord, praise his name. So this is the, and by the way, if you've ever been in ministry of any, any way, you know that this is probably your, your life too. <laughs> it's like, I can't believe this. I could do a lot of other things. Lord, let me go sell shoes and, or, or something. Let me do something else. This is terrible. Nobody listens. It's just a hard life. Um, oh yeah, but I can't. <laughs> you called me to do this. This is what you want in my life. Okay, this is what I'm going to do. All right, praise the Lord. Let's go. Here we go. All together now. Uh, or in, uh, in, do y'all remember Lawrence Welk? A one and a two all together. You know. Here we go. So I do remember Lawrence Welk. It was the reason why I didn't like to go to my call your grandparents on Saturday nights because that was what was on TV. <laughs> so we watched Lawrence Welk and then Hee Haw. Hee Haw came on after Lawrence Welk. I was not allowed to watch Hee Haw because of those girls. And uh, and so my parents made me watch Lawrence Welk and not Hee Haw. So now you know why I'm so warped. That's my life. Uh, Yeah, that's that's it. Uh, So anyway, any questions about Jeremiah yet? I know we went fast. That was by intention because I could really bog down in Jeremiah. Um, we still have about half of the book to go, and Lord willing, we'll cover that next week. Next week. Yes, ma'am, I see that hand. Right. Right, sure. Yeah, so, yeah, so this was, you you have to understand what Jeremiah's role was. So this was a singular command for him, not necessarily for us. Um, God has, in fact, Jesus instructed us to pray. Um, And while in Babylon, in Jeremiah 29, you could go and see, while they were in Babylon, um, God told them then to pray for Babylon, pray for the welfare of the city. Or seek the so this was a specific thing. So the reason why I believe he told Jeremiah not to pray for them is because Jeremiah's role was to announce the coming destruction of of the Lord, the coming judgment, and so he couldn't do that and also pray publicly for them. And so I, I think I think it's a, I think it's specific to Jeremiah, and I believe it was because of what his role was. God said, don't, don't pray for him. Now, certainly, if God ever tells you, don't pray, obey him. I've just never heard him tell me not to pray. <laughs> I think all the, all the rest of Scripture encourages God's people to pray. Right. Right. I didn't know why. And um, I never knew the pastor. I didn't see him or my mother. And I just did anything to try to get away from God. 
Right. Right. Yeah. Amen. So certainly when the Lord burdens, I believe that the Holy Spirit burdens God's people like you're talking about with special, special prayers, not just general prayers, not just, not just prayers that we ought to pray, but specifically for someone. And I believe that when that burden is lifted, I I believe that you are no longer under that compulsion to pray in that same way. So certainly I, I believe in that. But I also think that there are things that we ought to be praying for that we ought not to stop unless God shows us not, you know, to pray. So, like, uh, I believe that the Bible is clear that we ought to pray for uh, leaders, kings, those who are in authority, regardless of what, what denomination they are or what, uh, what little letter is after their name. We ought to pray for them. We ought to treat them the same. As, as like I, I'm, this is this is one of my problems with so-called Christians who are in the in the political square is I don't see them, I don't see their weights and measures being equal depending on who's in the in the office. Uh, I think that we ought to I think we ought to call sin sin regardless of who's in office, and I think we ought to pray for a person regardless of who's in office. I believe that both of those are our duties as believers. And, and yet I see lots of people um, giving their, their team a break, uh, you know, let, letting them, you know, and praying more for their team than praying for the other team. And I think that that's wrong. I, I think that um, I want you to know that just like everybody else, I've got a team. And, uh, but just like with my own family, I think the standards ought to be higher for my team than lower. You see, I, I let all kinds, y'all seen me at VBS, I let all kinds of kids do all kinds of things running around. I don't, I'm, but if they were my kids, no way. It wouldn't happen that way. That's the same way I am with my team, politics or whatever, my church. You know, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So uh, I, I have a strong, some of you may think, man, he talks weird about politics. It's just because I have a higher standard for, if I'm going to, if I'm going to identify with somebody, I'm going to hold them accountable. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to do it right. And so um, anyway, I digressed a little bit, but, but we ought to be praying for all of those folks. I don't believe the Lord has told us we shouldn't pray in that way. But for Jeremiah, he did. It was, it was a specific burden that he told him to. And, and you can read in the, and I, I would recommend, don't just take my, my brief points and look at them. Go back and read some of this stuff and see how strong it is, because it is indeed strong medicine. Um, they, they are, Jeremiah sees people taken into exile in his lifetime. I mean, this, they are on the cusp of a downfall. They're right there. Any other questions? That's, that was, that's a good, a good uh, point and good question, Ms. Carroll. Somebody else? Anybody else? All right. God bless you. Have a, uh, let me, t- oh, I do need to tell you this. So um, today is the last Thursday in July. Next week is the first Thursday in August. August begins I need to check. I'm about to say something that I think is true. August begins Young Hearts again on the fourth, on on the fourth Thursday of every month. So we will begin to only meet in here, us right now, only three of the four weeks of a month or three of the four Thursdays. And that last one will be Young Hearts. The reason is, is Young Hearts existed before Old Testament survey did. I started Old Testament survey when some of the Young Hearts folks still didn't want to come back and get together for uh, during COVID, but I, I did it knowing that when they came back, I would I would give them back whatever Thursday they wanted um, because they they were before, and it's just to me it's right instead of me just because I'm the pastor saying go find your own day. So 
that's what's happening. And I encourage you all to participate in that. It's, it'll be a good, it's a good time to get together. They do, they eat together, which is more than we do. They, uh, um, they spend time, they do trips and those kind of things. And so that'll start, I believe, at the end of next month. But anyway, I'll let you know for sure as we get closer. But God bless you. Have a great day, and I will see you Sunday morning.